Moshi Monsters. A virtual world for kids to adopt their very own monster of which they can feed, play with, and dress up until their heart's content, as well as explore, complete secret missions, decorate the home, and make friends. This game was a huge part of my childhood, and despite the game shutting down well over a year ago, the community is still crazy for this world. In this video, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the Moshi universe, looking at the deep secrets behind in-game events, the effects Moshi monsters had on the real world, legal issues from massive pop stars, complex ARGs for £100,000, and much more. This is the Moshi Monster Iceberg. For those of you unfamiliar with the Iceberg format, we cover secrets, conspiracies, and more from a particular franchise or genre. The deeper we go down the iceberg, the more obscure and sometimes creepy these points can get. We're starting off in the sky. This section of the iceberg contains things that most people, even vaguely aware of the Moshi brand, may know, such as parents, teachers, and those of you that never even played the game, but had that one annoying friend that never shut up about it. If you've been in a book or toy store in the last 13 years, chances are you would have come across at least some Moshi merch. This ranges from collectible figures, dozens of books, plushies, video games, accessories, board games such as Guess Who and Monopoly, and much, much more, which we'll all get into later. The majority of these projects were a huge success, partially due to each unique item promising a free in-game code for rocks, the in-game currency, or an exclusive item for your room. I actually bought a £100 mystery box full of all of these products you can check out if you're curious after this video. Because of the captivating world building Mind Candy had brought into the in-game world, 2013 saw the debut of the Moshi Monster movie. Yes, that was actually the full title. This movie saw one of each Moshi species track down the villain of the franchise Doctor Strange Club in order to protect a Moshling egg. Moshlings being small pets that you can catch for your monster's home and zoo. This movie, however, received a very mixed response, averaging a score of 4.8 out of 10 and a 60% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes, in contrast to an amazing 78% viewer score. Again, just being another perfect example of why film critics know nothing about a film, because this movie was an absolute emotional masterpiece with a soundtrack to rival Avengers and Titanic and will never have the magic brought down by a bunch of middle-aged divorced. I thought the movie was good. But with these mixed responses, no sequel was ever made. The Moshi Fandom Wiki has a basic synopsis of a follow-up sequel, but I've been unable to find another official source discussing this, so it's likely just some fanfiction. Moving on from a movie with a great soundtrack, Moshi Musics was an official label launched in 2012 in partnership with Sony Music. Under this label, two albums were released, one having the OST from the movie, and the other being Music Rocks, by Jason Perry, formerly of A, which included 19 original songs that reached the top 5 in the UK and number 2 in Scotland's charts. Overall, Moshi Monsters released 39 songs with over a dozen animated music videos. The background music for this video is actually the instrumental to several of these songs. Going back into the online world of Moshi Monsters, the big threat the players faced was Clonk, or the Criminal League of Naughty Critters. This organisation included many characters, but most noticeably, Dr. Strangeglove, the main antagonist of the entire franchise, Sweet Tooth, the Glumps, and... Simon Growl? They obviously base his character off of real celebrity Simon Cowell. But that's a bit far, right? Clonk is led by an unseen leader behind a menacing chair, and is the primary driving force for the Super Moshi missions. And as for their schemes... Glumps and the minions of Clonk seem throughout many other games causing chaos. The mischievous blobs you can see throughout Monstro City are actually revealed to be the cute, innocent moshlings that have been glumpified through the Glumpatron 3000. Despite the 12 unique species of glumps, when a moshling is glumpified, the outcome is completely random. A snookums might come out as a bloopy one time, but next could be a squiff. And nobody wants to be a squiff. The other 10 glump types are Blackjack, Bruiser, Fabio, Fishlips, Freak Face, Mustachio, Ned, Pirate Pong, Podge, and Rocco. And don't worry, that's not all one glumps. We'll be visiting these fellas again further down the iceberg. When I played the game, I of course enjoyed the puzzles, the missions, the arcade machines you could buy for your house for less than the price of five pairs of boxes. 
But after a while, I would start to spend most of my time on the forums. The forums were available just above the main game, and there were categories for everything, such as the welcoming committee where you could introduce yourself, a Q&A because back in the day kids didn't know they could just go to Google for anything they wanted, the friendship, which is where I spent most of my time and met many friends, and golden oldies, where parents and teachers could discuss, and kids never went in here to wind people up. Never. Forums slowly became the main way to speak to people, as the pinball system was inefficient for long conversations, and you couldn't meet in town to chat, like in other virtual worlds like Club Penguin and Bin Weevils. Everyone tried to time clicking on Sludge Street or Ula Lane at the same time as their friends, but it never worked. Tragically, the forum shut down around 2014. I couldn't find an official date, but this was likely as a response to the abuse of the ability to speak to anyone, and the ease for anyone to instantly find a discussion between a bunch of children. We've already spoken about the merchandise, but I had to make a separate section for Moshi Bands. Similar to the Loom Band outbreak of 2014, Silly Bands were small rubber bands that resembled animals, or in this case, Moshi Monsters. There are a total of 56 of these to collect, including rare rainbow bands. There's nothing too special about these, but this really hit hard with the nostalgia, so I had to put it on the iceberg. To end this chapter of the iceberg, we have to end the chapter as a whole. After Adobe announced they were stopping support on the Flash Player in 2019, Mind Candy came out on November 13th, saying that Moshi Monsters would close its doors for the final time on December 13th of that same year. There were some issues causing some accounts to remain open until January 29th, 2020, but after that, it was all gone. Petitions were started and social media pages were flooded, but there was nothing they could do. Our rocks, our trophies, our moshlings, our messages, our high scores, our monsters, everything would be gone, except for our memories. And as it turns out, memories are more powerful than we ever imagined. Just a week after the closure of the game, people were on Reddit hounding for any information about a potential private server or emulation for Moshi Monsters. A version was found through Flashpoint, a restoration emulation project where you could still play your favourite Flash games after Flash Player shut down. This meant you could take control of Builder 101 and play the Moshi Monster game. But everyone that did this would control this account, so there was no community. And progress reset every time you closed the game, so there was no sense of progression until July 13th, 2020, when the beta for a fan-made Moshi Monsters rewritten became public, using archived assets to recreate, as best they can, the game that held almost 100 million accounts. And despite no original accounts being able to be carried over, this project was flooded with support, and is still being worked on to this day, implementing more and more features every month. Most updates are posted in their Discord server, you can join through a link in this description. The game isn't completely like the original, for example as of recording this, you cannot catch moshlings in your garden or after missions, instead you click below the game to get any moshling you want for free. On top of this, there are some visual bugs regarding the XP meter, you cannot gather rocks from trees, these are all being worked on by a passionate team and I still log on every few days to check out what's new. One of the most known controversies around Moshi Monsters came from a moshling named Lady Goo Goo or as I like to call her, Lady Gone Gone. Introduced on December 6th, 2010, Lady Goo Goo the Glitzy Boohoo was introduced as a reward for completing the very first Super Moshi mission as part of the secret set. There had been several other parodies of real world celebrities in the game thus far, including 49 Pence, Banana Montana, Broccoli Spears and the Goo Brothers. But whilst these were merely references of instrumentals available in the underground disco minigame, Lady Goo Goo was a collectible moshling that requires you to be a paid Moshi member to receive. On top of this, Lady Goo Goo released two singles, Peppy Ratsy and The Moshi Dance, and was featured as part of a series of real-world collectible figures. Because the line between parody and using someone's likeness for profit and notability, Lady Gaga was not happy with this to go-go ahead any further. And on the 14th of October 2011, London's High Court ruled an injunction preventing any further musical releases from Lady Goo Goo. Following this, Mind Candy altered the Moshling's appearance, took the music videos down and changed the name of Lady Goo Goo to Baby Rocks, whom released on November 26th, 2012. At this point, even though Lady Goo Goo was no longer attainable in-game, both her and Baby Rocks 
was still recognized as two separate Moshling entities. Now speaking of things that are hard to digest, did you know that Moshi Monsters ventured into the land of food and drink? Like real world snacks? These included, but were not limited to, bacon flavoured potato snacks, Moshling's magic water, magic chalk, Fluffy's foamy gummies, ice lollies, and even had temporary takeovers of Froobs, and even more surprisingly, Typhoon tea. Now I've not been able to find any reviews or even any way to purchase these items anywhere online, but I don't want to live in a world where magic water and foamy gummies aren't nice. So I'm going to tell you all now that they are delicious. Moshi Monsters launched on the 16th of April 2008, but a beta was available for playtesters, which mainly consisted of staff behind the game, from the 14th of September 2007. I was six. Shortly after this, on November 9th 2007, a video tour or trailer was released on YouTube. This is one of the only public looks into the beta because, as I said, the beta testers were mainly made up of Moshi staff. However, most of the notable changes between this early version and the final release are UI based, where there was, in my opinion, a better looking inventory, having the daily puzzle in your room rather than the puzzle palace, keeping track of your right versus wrong answers in the top left of your screen, plus having your level and monster rating in your top right as opposed to on the left hand side. I'm not a game designer, and I've never coded anything with Flash Player before, but I believe it's most likely that these changes took place for performance purposes, requiring less assets to be loaded in. In addition, some of these changes could have been put in place after the public release, because I didn't start playing until 2009 when my friend Saffron introduced me to the game, and even then, that was 12 years ago. January 2011 saw the release of a brand new Moshi Monster magazine. You could buy these in stores or get a 6 or 12 month subscription where the magazines would be delivered to you one week before publication for a cheaper price. The original retail price of these was £2.99 with an extended issue 11 rising it for a one time only fee to £3.99. These Moshi mags, as they called them, included comic strips, puzzles, competitions, in-game secrets and exclusive codes for your monster. From a framed edition of the magazine in-game and a plushy werewolf, to giant gummy bears and monster trucks, with subscription owners giving you brand new moshlings such as Dustbin Beaver, more on him later, and Weagle, plus a real life plushy Iggy. Within the first six months, over a hundred thousand issues were being circulated, and the figures kept growing all the way until the magazine peaked in 2012, with almost a quarter of a million copies of each issue sold. But from here, it all started going monstrously wrong. In October 2013, the magazine was cancelled in America and Canada, and in May 2014, subscriptions became unavailable in Australia and New Zealand, but they were still shipped out to the major retailers. In November of that same year, all remaining subscription plans were discontinued due to the rising Royal Mail costs, making the issues an in-store exclusive. On top of this, the back issues, early renditions, that were available through the website were also stopped in late 2013. In April 2015, after issue 54 was released, Egmont Publishing took over publication of the magazine, changing the release date from a Thursday to a Wednesday, as well as lowering the texture quality and increasing the price. Just eight months later, in January of 2016, Egmont had the brilliant idea to permanently increase the price to £4.99, almost doubling the original issues and took the route of focusing more on free gifts and less on the content. However, it was reported that many of these gifts were simply repeats. This lasted for a whole three issues before the Moshi Mag was laid to rest. The magazines weren't the only way to get secret codes, however. We spoke about the Moshi Monster YouTube channel earlier, and not only did they promote new updates and create competitions for fans, but also made some video series, such as a Moshi Universe news show with a code at the end of every edition, and a treasure hunt where two presenters, Becca and Will, gave clues about a specific moshling across five different videos. At the end of these five videos, you would take the first letter of each moshling you got and rearrange them to get the name of another moshling. And the prize for this was... Post your answers in the comments below, and we can prove once and for all that Moshi fans are the coolest, cleverest, most monsterific fans in all the world. Moshi Monster Village was one of many mobile games launched during the franchise's peak, 
and it took the formula of being a top-down city simulator, similar to Simpsons Tapped Out and Cityville. Despite Moshi Monsters Village being the most popular Moshi Monsters app to this date, after the release in December 2013 in the UK, and an international release in February of 2014, the final logged update I could find was 19th of May 2014. And sadly, after iOS 11 on September 19th 2017, the game stopped being supported completely. Other discontinued Moshi Monster apps include Moshi Carts, Talking Poppet and Moshling Rescue. As of May 2021, the only supported Moshi Monsters app is the Great Moshling Egg Hunt, which has you collect Moshling eggs daily as you try and complete your zoo with all 235 different types. This is the last remaining Moshi Monsters app available, but not the last still under the Moshi brand. Moshi Twilight, rebranded to simply Moshi after Moshi Monsters closed, is a meditation and mindfulness app aimed at children put on the App Store December 2017. At first this may seem out of the blue, but Michael Acton Smith, also known as Mr. Moshi, was actually the co-founder of Calm, one of the most well-known mindfulness apps to this day. The short bedtime stories include characters and location from the Moshi Monsters universe to help send people off to a better night's sleep each night. Buster's Daily Diary is a series of 29 different stories about finding different Moshlings including DJ Quack, Peppy, Bernie and Gurgle, with a second season holding another 28 short stories, and another 50 plus unrelated tales. To paraphrase Mr. Moshi in 2017, everyone is becoming a slave to their phone in this busy world with an addictive nature, and after seeing some of his other projects including Bar Bar Land, an 8 hour slow cinema film, and Calm.com, it feels like combining his two biggest projects was the obvious next step. Something that wasn't seen as the obvious next step on the other hand, was World of Warriors, a mobile app launched by Moshi Monster's parent company Mind Candy in November 2014. This has since been discontinued on the App Store, but is still available on the PS4 for $24.99 despite it being originally free to play. World of Warriors would have you create a team of fighters to slay enemies in a rock, paper, scissors style, with moves unique to each character based upon a historical figure, so you can level up and progress through the story or battle friends in an online versus mode. Is it bad that this is the first game since Spider-Man that has actually made me want a PlayStation? Heading back into murky waters, after the initial Moshi Monster launch, there was some controversy surrounding Kluku, a bird that sits in your moshling garden, giving you hints on possible combinations to attract your favourite moshlings. Unfortunately, people thought these hints sucked. Since the internet wasn't as widespread with niche information as it is today, especially for a kid's game, Kluku was the main source of garden tips, and they were reportedly very cryptic, sometimes giving plant combinations, but not necessarily an order or colour to go alongside it. This was, however, until July 2013, when Kluku would have such a big rave, that they would lose their voice. Forever. Although flagged as a bug by developers, it later came out that this was to make way for in-game seed combination boxes, available for members to purchase. And on the hot topic of drama, remember Dustbin Beaver? Him and Lady Google were initially released as part of the second series of Moshling figures, but were never to reappear after this, as well as being absent from the original set and the ultimate collection guide. This was due to Lady Gaga's lawsuit, and although there is nothing I could find on Justin Bieber taking similar action, it can be assumed that Dustin Bieber was also taken out as a precaution to prevent any more legal issues. Despite this though, Dustin Bieber still remained in game until it closed, but the focus was shifted to a brand new mop top tweeny bop named Zack Binspin, who came out with one of the biggest moshy music bangers ever. Sparks was another brand new Moshling introduced in an awesome way. Exclusive to the Egg Hunt mobile game, Sparks was the winning application to the 2018 Designer Moshling competition, making them the final fan-made Moshling to be created, as there was no contest in 2019. However, there were many more runner-ups and winners leading to this, some of which even got to appear as figurines in the shops. Chronologically, the winners were Liberty, Toasty, Yolka, Pinestein, who has an IQ of 256,000, Micro Dave, King Toot, Wrangle, Woodsworth, and Ramsey. Piper was the winner of the 2014 competition, but no release or news was ever put out about her for reasons unknown. 
other cool stuff that snuck out of the screen and into reality were events, primarily in England, but some in other parts of the UK too. Whether it was Jamie Oliver teaching players how to make a rainbow wrap, the pop-up shop that was so popular it ran for over three times the planned time period, the Moshi Monsters and Sea Life partnership, which had fans go to aquariums where they could do an activity book, swap their figurines for rare and different ones, as well as a quiz and online rewards in order to promote the preservation of marine life. Which sounds just awesome. Arguably the biggest event that took place was in August of 2014, six years after the game's launch, where Blue Water in the UK would host the dubbed Moshi Monster Experience. This was a five hour, two day event featuring mascots such as Poppet, Furry, Diablo, Katsuma, and Mr. Moshi himself, where you could get the Scamp plush before release, as well as activity stations where you could get Moshi face painting, singing, and best of all, a Moshi tattoo station. 2011 celebrated the wedding of Prince William and Kate Middleton, which you may or not be interested in. What you will be interested to hear, however, is the implementation of Prince Sillyham and Kate Giggleton, even though these characters never had a prominent role in game, they featured on an in-game plate and in the mashup card game. And it's just kind of nice to have little time pieces like that, I think. As well as mobile games, the Moshi Monster team ventured out into the Flash game scene. You could either play these games on some independent websites like Congrate or in the Moshi theme park. Some of these included Peppy Stump Bike, Run Shall Be Run, Where's Iggy, and Lady Goo Goo Dress Up. I'm starting to understand the lawsuit more and more. If any of you played Moshi Monsters between the years 2008 and 2013, you may remember seeing Ken Tickles and a Born Squash, better known as the construction workers. This is what really prepared us for how long real world roadworks take, because these guys drilled down and ate sandwiches in the same spot for five years. I genuinely believe that this was never gonna bring anything, because the entire time I played the game consistently, nothing ever did. However, in early 2013, the pair moved a few feet up Main Street to reveal a chocolate refinery they had been working on, which leaves us perfectly further down the iceberg. In 2012 saw Series 4 of the Moshi collectible figures, however this time something was... different. Five golden tickets were hidden in these packs across the UK, and those that found them would be invited to visit the Moshi Monsters headquarters. It's literally Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but nobody died. One of these five winners would receive a solid gold Iggy and their weight in Moshi prizes, whilst the other four would get a huge goodie bag. However, this wasn't the only time golden tickets were available. Back in March 2010, Moshi Monsters hit 15 million monsters, and if you wanted to attend the 15 million monster party, you had to have one of 100 golden tickets. These were obtained by sending an image of you proving yourself to be the biggest Moshi fan to the team, where 100 winners and 100 parents would be invited. This gave players two unique room items, an in-game aquarium, and an exclusive 15 million plaque. Remember the Glumps? They weren't just a menace in Monstro City, but were also an issue for the Moshi Monster legal team. Early 2014 had facial disfigurement charities Changing Faces launch a campaign against the game for the Glumps names. Specifically, Fish Lips, Freak Face, and Pirate Pong. It was argued that having villain's main character trait be based off of their appearance teaches negative messages towards kids, creating a disconnect for children trying to imagine being friends with somebody with similar disfigurations. To insert my opinion in here quickly, I would usually agree with changing faces, because I think having villains be villains because of their appearance is a lazy trope and poor writing. But in this case, it's literally a game about monsters, and as we've already covered, Glumps are glumpified mushlings, whose main trope is to be cute, therefore the uglification of these adorable creatures into evil abominations is the entire point of the Glumps, and having them all look like Bloopy would just make them another cute creature in the world. Regardless, Mind Candy did not change any names or appearances, but did have meetings with changing faces and remarked that they would hope to be working with them in the near future. The project has started to lose money as we got further into the 2010s, so in 2015 plans were revealed to reboot Moshi Monsters from a game aimed at 6 to 12 year olds to a game meant for 4 to 7 year olds, 
focusing more on animations as opposed to the side-scrolling format of the original game, with a change to the toys and more apps launched for mobile users in the future. It's unclear how this would have looked, however, as the only significant changes to the game following this announcement were that of the forum removal and the entire game closing down with Flash. However, this does leave possibility for another Moshi Monsters project in the future, most likely based on Android or iOS due to the closing of Flash, and just the amount of young children with tablets, although this would contradict Michael Acton Smith's statement in 2017, two years after the reboot announcement, describing his dislike of the addictive nature of mobile devices. So really, it's anyone's guess. One of the most successful branches of the Moshi franchise was the collectible figures, with Series 5 launching in January of 2013. This time though, something was very, very wrong. The front art of the packets clearly showed Snozzle Wobble Scene, the grocery store owner, but he was never to be found in any of the packs. Turns out that somehow the production company had just forgotten to make him. In March of the same year, this correction was fixed, and Mr. Moshi marked March the 16th as Snozzle Wobble Scene Day. Next time someone forgets about me, I'm going to mark that day as Papali Day. Nothing special happens. You just have to subscribe. Similar errors were also made with Micro Dave being promised in both Series 7 and 8, and Pinestein being confirmed in Series 10, who never came to be in said packs. But likewise with Snozzle, this was rectified in Series 12, where they both appeared. If only things today actually delivered what they advertised. ASA, or the Advertising Standards Authority, were not happy with other Moshi related advertisement. And the same went for Bin Weevils. The Super Moshis were the superhero group of the Moshi world, which you had to be a member to join. Adverts were posted on the side of the game, saying, The Super Moshis need you, which was argued to pressure children into paying money. This ad was clearly a play on the old conscription posters during the World Wars, and nobody told Churchill that he wasn't allowed to do it back then. This escalated quickly, and actually put Moshi Monsters on an advertisement blacklist until the changes were made which they were very quickly, and no further negative action had to be taken. Have you heard the name Moshi Monster Kitty before? This was a huge Moshi-centered YouTube channel with over 17,000 subscribers and almost 10 million views, which for 2014 was a pretty big deal, especially for a 12-year-old opening Moshi Monster toys. Moshi Monster Kitty, or Lucy Neef, was popular to the point that she was contacted by Guinness World Records Yes, they contacted her about her collection of almost 2,000 pieces of Moshi-related merchandise, giving her the world record. This, in turn, gave her attention from Mr. Moshi, who invited her over to Moshi HQ, where she made a video on the official Moshi Monster YouTube channel with Will, who we saw earlier. Unfortunately, Lucy has since deleted her YouTube channel, and there is almost no sign of her on YouTube anymore. Except for a single vlog from Anastasia Moshi, where the two girls met up to buy Moshi related stuff. Now if you're watching this, and are also somehow in the beauty community on YouTube, which is, this is quite a crossover, then you may be familiar with Anastasia Moshi, whereas her new channel is called Anastasia Kingsnorth, with over 1 million subscribers. Aside from Anastasia's old vlog however, there are no signs of the Moshi Monster Kitty, but I hope she's doing well. To round off the middle of the iceberg before we delve into the really crazy part of the video, I just thought I'd highlight that Fernando, the Lucky's Cat, is the rarest Moshi figure out there, not including the exclusives for competition winners, with only 5,001 ever being made. Oh. And Moshi Monster Kitty has three of them. Meiji Sao Gei Shao, or Little Monster in Chinese, was tagged as a Moshi Monster clone back in the 2010s before closing down in 2015. However, the game received a reboot in 2020 as Magic Monster. Taking place on Monster Planet, there are six monster types that are all based in a specific plane or biome, and are named Makard, Nana, Babe, Zaza, Buddy, and Crabbo, and are all able to collect small pets dubbed as elves, of which there are 29 unique ones ranging from being common, rare, or endangered. Four books about this game have been released along with six bookmarks and several comics. When I was researching this, I thought the Moshi clone tag was unfair, 
But as I stumbled onto China's YouTube, I came across this video. Why is there a pigeon? What do you think of when you hear Moshi Monsters? If you made it this far, then it's probably fun, nostalgic, cute, friendly. How about offensive, unconventional, and downright rude? Before the launch of Mind Candy in 2004, Michael Acton Smith, Mr. Moshi, launched a website called Firebox.com. If you've never seen or heard of Firebox before, it's a quirky gift shop online with unusual and unique products. To name a few from the top 50, we have Snoop Dogg's Cookbook, Java Cake Gin, Giant STDs, 100 Ways to Eat Chicken, Strasticles, Spreadable Whiskey, and How to Swear Around the World. I made an effort not to swear then, just in case someone's watching this sitting down with their child or younger sibling, showing them what a good childhood game looks like. So for you, Sarah, you're welcome. It's unclear if Michael still has any input or stocks in the company, but I just thought the change in his target market was funny and a perfect example of why you should never put yourself in a box. Even if your box is a firebox and is in the top 100 privately owned businesses in the UK. Let me know in the comments, who's your favourite Moshling? As a kid, mine was Fifi. Once I became a member, it was Mini Ben. And now it's between DJ Quack and Chop Chop. But what about Professor Perplex? He's just an owl, right? A purple, clever owl. What if I told you that this innocent bird's name is actually from an ARG, an alternate reality game, worth £100,000 in 2005? The Reseda Cube was a priceless scientific and spiritual artifact that had been stolen from Perplex City, a mysterious alien civilization, and was now buried on Earth somewhere. Mind Candy sold puzzle cards in packs of six, each card being part of a set of four, with a total of 256 unique cards varying in rarity, just like Moshling figures would be in the future. These puzzle cards would contain, you guessed, puzzles or riddles on them, and once solved could be entered on the Perplex City website for points to help you climb a leaderboard. But that's not all the cards were for. It was discovered that many cards would have ultraviolet or heat sensitive ink on them, displaying references to pop culture, brain teasers, and more. In 2020, two of these cards have still remained unsolved. One had you prove the Riemann hypothesis, which is the proposition that the Riemann zeta function only has its zeros at the even negative integers and complex numbers with the real part 1 over 2. I don't know what that means, but it's considered as one of the most important unsolved mathematical problems to date. The other unsolved card had a face, and the phrase, find me. That, that I understand. For 15 years, this remained unsolved. However, in December of 2020, the man was finally found. And when found, he was instructed to tell whoever found him what the real question for that card was. But it had been almost two decades. He'd forgotten. I actually watched a documentary here on YouTube on this card a few weeks ago, not aware that it was at all related to any of this. So I'll link that below if the search for a mysterious man anywhere on Earth for 15 years has caught your fancy. Eventually, the cube was found in Northamptonshire on the 2nd of February 2007 by Andy Darley. A second season of this game was announced following the find, but was then put on an indefinite hold until this day. So next time you look at the cute purple owl, remember, there's still one card unsolved. The fact that Professor Perplex is an owl is also very interesting, seeing as the cube was found in a wooded area. Maybe if the cube was still undiscovered on Moshi Monster's launch, could this have been an additional hint? Or just a harmless reference? Now, this is freaky. Throughout this video, we spoke about Mr. Moshi, Michael Acton Smith, a lot. And something about his name resonated with me. Something clicked. Maybe it's the solution to the final Perplex City card? Professor Perplex is purple. And there is a purple man in a popular gaming series called Five Nights at Freddy's, with the purple man's identity being Michael Afton, one letter different from Michael Acton. To further this puzzle, Michael Smith is also the surname of an actor, Corey Michael Smith, well known for his role in Gotham as Batman villain the Riddler. There's really nothing more to this, I just wanted to sound clever, and there was really nothing too deep on this game. It really just seems like a wholesome kid's experience, which is 
really, really nice for a change. <laughs> This was my very first iceberg video, so it means a lot that you made it to the end. It took me two days just for researching this, building the iceberg, and script writing alone. So if you did enjoy or learn anything from this, then I really appreciate a like down below just to let me know I've done a good job. On top of that, if you think I've missed anything at all, let me know in a comment. And if I get lots of comments, I'd love to make a part two. So subscribe if you don't want to miss that. Thank you so much again for watching, and please, have a great day.